All right. Good morning, y'all. Uh, this is Ben at Bates Nursery. Uh, it's Wednesday morning, almost noon, and today we're going to talk about living fences. I know we're kind of starting to get into the spooky Halloween season, but um, one more landscape uh, uh, anecdote and topic before we get into that. Um, living fences is something that I've dealt quite a bit with. The demand has been growing over the years as you know, the, the amount of room people have for these screen trees and plants is really reduced. Um, and sometimes these living fences, uh, green walls, living walls, there's a lot of different terms out there. Um, that's what we're talking about today. And of course, if y'all have any questions, um, just let us know and, and Tyler will redirect those to me. So um, just if y'all have any questions, just let us know. We can stop and uh, address that. Uh, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and get in the PowerPoint first thing, and then after that we'll take a look at some of these plants that we have on the table, just as some idea suggestions, uh, and we'll go through that. Okay, so we're going to start with like, why are you going to do this? You know, what, what's the deal with the living fence? I can just pay someone to put up a, a wood fence and be done with it. Um, but there are some um, growing reasons and ideas why this might be a better option for you. Um, Screen block for privacy, like I said, but you may not have room for a green giant or an emerald green, and we can fit some of these green wall systems and vines into a much shallower space. Um, so you have more options for a small space. Um, it can be quicker and cheaper than large trees. A lot of these vines grow four to eight to ten feet a year, and so that's fast. Um, for a screen compared to an emerald green, that'll grow about a foot a year. Uh, making enclosed garden areas. This is one of my favorite things to work with. Um, so you've probably heard of garden rooms. Um, well, you can use some of these plants to create a, a sense of enclosed uh, space um, without having to use a, a huge wall of plants. Um, Semi-mobile, so a lot of folks can put vines or things in planters, and you can move those. So if you need like an open concept space or a patio, you can use these living fences um, as, as a mobile screen um, and change it uh, depending on your needs. And then it also makes spaces more inviting. Um, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to describe this without experiencing it, but if you've ever been somewhere that has planted courtyards with plants in pots, plants on walls, it really gives you a sense of um, nature and invitation and really softens a lot of that hard um, concrete and brick and other surfaces. Uh, alternate to wood and metal fences, I think that's a pretty obvious one. Um, I think wood fences and metal fences have their place, uh, but if we don't need to, say, contain an animal um, or something like that, a living fence may be a good alternative. Uh, and then green space, so a lot of this terminology really just depends on what you're desiring to do. You know, there's whole buildings that are certified. Um, for green space, like the green roof on the Music City Center, they also have, I believe, cross vine growing on the outside of that building. Um, but you can use it to help with exterior design, um, create patterns and textures. There's some really cool examples of these green walls with, with almost paintings on them. Um, and then environmental stewardship. So just, you know, taking care of our environment. We're introducing plants. Um, these can really help cool our surfaces and walls and introduce um, oxygen to the atmosphere. Uh, a lot of these are things y'all are probably very familiar with, but you know, there's good reasons to introduce these plants, living plants into your landscape. And then wow factor, you know, we'll show you some of these examples that are just like for making you step back and be like, wow, that's a wall of plants. Um, it can be really impressive. Okay, and then types and methods, and we'll, we'll jump into some more uh, fun pictures here in a second. So just kind of main um, methods I've seen with uh, fences, living fences, vines, and plants. Um, so that's kind of the number one thing I'm talking about. Quickest, most affordable vines are typically cheap and very fast growing. You know, there's manufactured trellis systems. You can do it yourself, and we'll show you kind of a method we used here. Um, and then maintenance would probably be something to consider. So vines do tend to just keep growing in their space. You will need to trim these. Some vines you may need to trim on a, a bi-monthly basis to keep them under control. Um, so do be considerate of how fast these plants grow and just, just maintenance as far as um, what you can handle. 
Uh, espalier. So this is a fancy term for basically a plant trained onto a fence. I've got a pyracantha behind me here. That's pretty traditional. Um, we see fruit trees trained onto fences. We see um, hornbeams and other European trees um, in this espalier method. It's kind of cool. It's kind of unique. Um, it's going to be more expensive if you're buying a pre-made espalier because it, it takes someone time to make that. Uh, and it takes a little longer to train something into this look. Um, now, if you're willing to have a little hands-on project, it can be really fun. Um, like I said, European formal looks. This is kind of a kind of a formal garden kind of thing with the fruit trees. Um, and you can get fruit out of this. You know, the pyracantha behind me has berries, not really edible. Um, but you can easily get apples and pears to bear on these living fences. Uh, prefab. So that's the last thing we'll talk about. And there's a ton of this stuff out there. Um, woolly pockets is something a lot of people are familiar with. My son's school uses woolly pockets to kind of encourage the kids to plant stuff, um, which is literally uh, like a felt mat that you can plant into and create a wall of plants. Um, of course, you're going to use different plants than vines. A lot of times we'll use perennials, annuals, stuff like that to fill them. Um, there's other systems out there. There's really advanced um, living wall systems that have water catchment and recirculation systems. Uh, most of these are going to be in commercial settings, but um, there are some really cool living walls that are not just the pockets. Um, I've seen plastic planters. Um, and there's also uh, do-it-yourself methods. So I've seen planter boxes attached to walls with cascades creating that living wall look. You can introduce color palettes with annuals, perennials. Um, you can rotate it. Um, the downside is you're probably going to need more plants in order to create that effect. All right, let's jump into some photos, y'all. Okay, we're just going to do some uh, just stock images I found of uh, these examples. Top left, woolly pockets. This is a really big woolly pocket wall, but it's, it's fairly common to see these um, in smaller scales really affordable for a home gardener. You literally just fill these containers with soil, water from above, and that'll wick into those lower plants. Um, the lower left, you know, you can create your own living walls using planters stacked or staggered. Um, I've even seen this in like kitchens or indoor plants. It's, it's pretty neat what you can do with these wall-mounted planters that weren't originally intended, intended as a living wall. Um, the bottom right are like urban fences. Um, so this is kind of neat. You see this a lot more in Europe, um, but it's, it's starting to make its way into the states and bigger cities, like with our Music City Center. Um, bottom left would be like a planter box with a trellis. You'll see these in like cafes. Pretty quick and easy way to get a screen. You don't need a lot of space. You can move these around. And then like the urban city walls, that's literally just um, fencing bound by concrete with ivy. So quick, easy, but it's got a really cool effect um, to the city streets and just makes it feel more alive and engaging. Uh, so these are some of my personal pictures. Uh, we took a trip to Charleston about a month ago, South Carolina, um, and our hotel had a courtyard, a completely enclosed courtyard with living walls. So I think this is some sort of a, like a jasmine, like an Asiatic jasmine wall in the lower left, and my wife with our son. Um, this is a really cool system, actually. This is a big wall. Um, it has a water catchment basin in it so they're actually able to catch all that water and keep it recirculating so they don't have to add all this water um, into that vine i will say there were a lot of mosquitoes and stuff in that courtyard so being considerate of fungus gnats and mosquitoes you can use something like bacillus to reduce that because plants do attract some insects so be considerate of that in the middle we went to magnolia plantation which is a really cool um, romantic era garden. They have camellia hedges in a horticultural maze. Really big hedges, but I mean, you get lost in these things. They create very um, sturdy, solid walls. They weren't blooming when we were there, but um, you know, you can't see over them and, until you get up on a ladder. So that's kind of a good idea of a living wall right there. 
Uh, and then the bottom right, something closer to home. So that's the poinsettia tree at Cheekwood. They have <clears throat> poinsettia walls there. And I think these are literally like a metal um, armature that they stick all these pots into. There's different methods for doing that, but these are literally all potted annual poinsettias where together you're getting that like wow factor. Like how did they do that? It's super impressive. Um, really cool. I recommend everyone going down to Cheekwood during Christmas uh, to see that stuff. So that that's an indoor living wall with poinsettias. And then here's kind of some of my personal projects. Um, so the bottom left with my dog, Patty, that's Crossvine. Um, and we're going to kind of show our example of Crossvine here. You know, three years and, and three plants, this stuff is covered. Um, we have a very dense screen on our porch. Blooms typically four to five months out of the year. Um, and then on the right, I have a Persian parodia, which did not start out as a spalier, but we've trained it onto a fence and it kind of creates an enclosure in our um, garden. So this is kind of a fun way to create an interesting shape and also create a little garden room for us. Uh, again, that's parodia, kind of a traditional espalier plant. Let's see. Okay, and then I'm gonna talk about something we did actually yesterday, a really wet day. Um, we went ahead and did something by our own trial garden and put up a quick and easy living fence um, project here. Um, so we've taken down some old wood fencing and put up some reused cattle fencing. Um, using a really simple way of mounting it, you can get as fancy as you need to with this, but our idea is to have this covered in the next year or two, so you shouldn't see any of this. Um, so in the first pictures, you can see we've kind of set our plant, chose our spacing, you know, get back and, and look at it. Um, you know, these things can grow 15 feet in every direction, so don't underestimate them. Um, so we kind of chose our spot, made sure our fence is mounted securely. And then planting, you know, we've kind of done some talks on this in the past, but just to reiterate it, um, you know, there's my knife for perspective. We have some old landscape mat. If you have landscape fabric, be sure to cut it back. Make a nice big hole so it can drain. And then the right picture, we have the pot where we've kind of outlined it to go about double the width of that pot um, to dig our hole. Okay, and our own earth mix landscape here is pictured. That's what I recommend conditioning your soil with. Um, you know, this soil was dark, but it had a lot of clay and it was very dense. So that earth mix um, landscape was a great product for this. You can see I have the pot in the top left to simulate my planting depth. Um, the middle, I've added that landscape to it. And then in the right, I've added some of the native clay to that landscape, mixed it up, and it just kind of, you can see that clay's kind of broken into chunks. Um, that's what I want to see. Is it kind of a good mixture? Eventually that plant will work its roots into that. Okay, almost done here with the, the uh, project garden. Um, cross vine on the left, you can see it's been stuck in the hole. And then the center, we have backfilled, packed it down, and then put some of that rock mulch on top of it. And then after that, I'm going to go ahead and take this plant off of its stakes. You want to be kind of gentle doing that. Um, depends on which plant you have. But usually they'll have three or four separate vines in them. And so I've gently separated those and laid them on the ground. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put those vines onto that fence. And initially you do wanna fasten them. There are so many fasteners out there. The big thing is put them on loose so you're not suffocating that plant. I did three different uh, fasteners on here. So the rubber tie that came with the cross vine on the left and in the center, um, we just have basically a plant tag. So some twine, you can tie that as a temporary tie. And then a zip tie, you know, everyone's got zip ties. We just want to make sure that it's loose. Um, you can use vinyl tape. You can use garbage bag tie material. As long as you keep that loose on that vine, it should take over. Okay. Um, and, you know, we'll uh, check back with you all on that. That cross vine, I swear, has already grown a few inches overnight. Super fast. And we'll kind of uh, update you all on how that's going. Uh, before we look at the plants, I'm just going to talk about plants in general that you can select for this. Um, vines, kind of the biggest um, 
thing that I would use for these fences, quick option. There's a lot of options for sun. Uh, cross vine and Carolina jessamine are evergreen, so that's a great choice um, even for a winter screen. <clears throat> Wisteria and trumpet creeper are notorious for being aggressive. So if you have a big area um, or a big arbor or trellis to cover, that's a good option. Just um, be aware that they can get out of hand fast. So just um, look at your, your wisterias and trumpet creepers when you consider it. They can form roots and structures, pull paint off walls. Um, so be considerate of that. Honeysuckle and cross vine, those are two great native vines. Um, can't promote them enough. So if you want to promote natives, promote native pollinators, uh, there are some options. And then edibles, you know, grapes, hops. Uh, you could probably even do brambles like raspberry, blackberry on a fence. Um, so you get to eat from your living fence. How's about that? Even extra stuff. Um, shade vines were a little bit more limited. A lot of the sun vines will grow but be more sparse. Uh, Clematis armandii, I've got one of those over somewhere behind me. Um, that is an evergreen cross vine, uh, one of the only shade evergreens I would think, other than something like ivy. Uh, all Clematis need a little bit of shade, they can kind of burn up in the sun. And then uh, climbing hydrangea, that's one of our common shade vines. That one will form roots and surfaces, so just like our wisteria and trumpet creeper. Um, just be aware that when it latches onto a surface, it can form roots. So if you want it there, great. If you don't want it there, be, be cautious. Uh, and then the rest of the plants you could use for a living fence. Uh, fruit trees for the espalier. Um, apples, pears are the most common. Pyracantha, I've got one of those behind me. That is kind of a privacy hedge. So it forms beautiful berries, but it's got really big thorns on it. Um, you can literally put this up against a wall and, you know, it could keep someone from, say, climbing into a second story window. And then deciduous trees. You know, there's a lot of them. You could really do just about anything that's that's hardy. Um, Persian parodia is one of my favorite picks. Uh, you saw the picture of mine in my garden. European hornbeam, that's a fairly popular one to manipulate. Willows, because of those soft, quick-growing branches, you can form a wall really fast. Uh, and then lastly, perennials. So that's what I've kind of got in front of me here. Perennials are good for those woolly pockets, those planted walls for that, like, um, artistic color scape there. And it really just depends on seasonality, seasonality, location, indoor, outdoor. Um, you know, we'll look at shade and sun, but like ferns, heucheras, sedges, those are all really popular in living walls. And then in the sun, you know, things that can take it dry, like asters, succulents, sedums, um, even grasses like other sun sedges would be good in uh, pocket gardens. And then annuals, you know, uh, vegetables. Uh, we're going into pansy season with violas right now. Those would be a great option for a pocket garden, and you could switch that up and introduce color. Uh, vining annuals, so, you know, we're looking at creeping jenny, sedums, um, ivy, all sorts of other things that will spill. That creates awesome texture. And then just generally aim for tough stuff. If it's tough, low maintenance, you should be able to take care of it pretty easy. Most of these living walls are very comparable to taking care of it in a container. Um, so that's all I have for the slides. I do have plants around me. We can talk about those for a minute and just kind of my favorite selections. Um, and then if you all have any questions, just, you know, let us know. We'll take a look at these plants. Um, I'll start with vines. So behind me to the left here, I do have, this is Clematis armandii. So this is the evergreen uh, Clematis. Uh, real nice tropical looking leaf. It puts white blooms on intermittently. Uh, really one of the few shade clematises that is going to be evergreen. They're not super aggressive, although they will grow vigorously. Uh, I do have the other two evergreen vines up here in the front. Uh, so Carolina jessamine, that's the yellow blooming jessamine. Not really fragrant like jasmine. Uh, but these do have a nice glossy evergreen foliage to them. Um, this is just generic Carolina jessamine. There's all sorts of varieties. Typically all white, uh, sorry, all yellow. Um, but that's an evergreen vine. 
And then cross vine, you know, I've probably said cross vine 10 times by now. And you can see the little uh, tangerine blooms there. Cross vine's one of my favorites as far as it being a native. It really is truly evergreen for me in full sun, no problem. Um, great blooms for pollinators and, and an easy grower and also easy to remove. You know, it has tendrils, so if you have to get it off a surface, it's not too difficult. Uh, other vines here I'll mention, these are all deciduous vines, meaning they'll lose their leaves. So this is Major Wheeler Honeysuckle. This is our native honeysuckle, so it'll be kind of in that, uh, excuse me, that kind of red spectrum, that kind of warm um, orangey red color, kind of like the cross vine. So that's our native honeysuckle. Uh, I do have just a white clematis. I think this one's toki. Um, so here's Clematis. Of course, the blooms are very recognizable. Probably some of the biggest blooms uh, out of all the vines we've talked about. So that's Clematis. Uh, maybe give it a little bit of protection, a little bit of shade during the day. And then Wisteria. Um, you know, we do sell American and Asian Wisterias. The American Wisterias, uh, we try to promote more. Uh, they're maybe not quite as aggressive and not as bad about suckering. Still, just be a little aware this is a pretty vigorous vine. Um, if you need to cover a big area, it's a great choice, a very heavy bloomer in the summer. Uh, that's wisteria. And this is blue moon. So this is an American wisteria. Oh, uh, sorry. Amer uh, Amethyst Falls. Uh, so that's a really good option. We don't have trumpet creeper, but that's going to be very similar as far as habit. Uh, I do have pyracantha. So we talked about a spalier. I just have one example with me here today. But you can see this has been trained on a fence. You know, you can hedge these, you can shrub them. Um, but on a fence, you can literally put this right up against a wall. There probably are some berries in here, but there are thorns in here that you can't see. So um, dual purpose, ornamental, screening, and security. Uh, so that's pyracantha. Uh, again, you know, you could do this with an apple. You could do this with something else, training it on this fence. Um, it's really not as difficult as it looks. It just takes a little time uh, and a little bit of TLC to do it. Okay, so lastly in front of me, um, we'll just kind of take a look at these. And, and these are all perennials or annuals in front of me. This is kind of what we're suggesting for woolly pockets or wall gardens or if you're planting in holes in your walls. These are all really cool options. And I like to put these really tight. So you can see if you put these tight together, um, you're going to get a really cool texture and color effect. So like some of these green sedges, um, you know, you can play with your neon greens and your dark greens with your sedges. Um, and those would spill over the wall. And then we have sedum and heuchera down here. You know, those are great options for color, yellows, purples, um, ivies, vines, Let's see what else we have. Ferns, autumn fern, that is an evergreen fern. Ferns are great to add a soft texture uh, into these living walls. You see a lot of these living walls that are like 100% fern, and it's kind of neat because they start playing with the color and texture. Uh, what else do I have? Heuchera, I have some catmint. You know, catmint's become fairly popular. It'll spread to fill, and it also has some insect repellent qualities to it because of that smell. Um, so, you know, with something like catmint or citronella plant, we can get a dual purpose, um, say if this is on a courtyard or something. But all of these are relatively hardy if you put them in the right location as far as sun, shade. Um, the thing I don't really have up here, annuals, flowering annuals, vegetables, those are definitely options. Uh, I would just assume with these woolly pockets and wall gardens, that you're going to have to rotate some of this stuff out as it will outgrow that area. So, um, yeah, just a general touch on this topic. I know there's like all these branches with living walls. Um, but, yeah, let us know how we can help you or if you've got a living wall project, maybe we can, you know, recommend some options for you. So, um, but that's what I've got for you all today. All right. Uh Thank you, Ben. I'm not seeing any questions out there, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that next week we have a webinar led by Melissa McKay. It is fall bulbs, so everything about planting bulbs in the fall, selection, 
and when you want to do it, which is pretty much nowish, pretty soon. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we're we're in bulb season. We've just gotten a whole bunch of daffodils, like bags of them. So, yeah, it's time. Yeah. So that's that's going to be uh, Wednesday, October the thirteenth. Mm-hmm. Follow that up with fantasy plants. So mm-hmm. plants that are named after kind of fantastical elements like dragons and spells. Um, we also calling that like a D and D garden webinar. Yeah. So just a little bit of fun as we get into the spookier part of the season. And then finally, at the spookiest we have on October 27th, Bates little shop of horrors Two, where your own Ben Trest and Caroline Gann are going to get, Oh yes, we're ready to crank up the, the spook factor. We're going to get to the uh, goth. You know, I yeah. didn't mention, you know, we always want to interject some sort of seasonality in here. You know, we did talk the cross vine, um, it gets its name from when you cut it, especially a big stem, the cross section should look like a cross. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to ward away bad spirits, vampires, not a bad plant to have on the outside of your house. Um, I'd imagine it's probably pretty effective against evil spirits. So, you know, maybe we'll, uh, roll that cross vine into the Halloween season. Sounds great. <laughs> it is a plant with many uses. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. Well, I think we can uh, go ahead and wrap things up, Ben. So, all right. Thank y'all.